With close to 10,000 convenience stores in the US and over 60,000 around the world, you've probably been to a 7-Eleven location for coffee, gasoline refill or a cup of their very much loved slushy soft drink, Slurpee. But did you know that the 7-Eleven brand coming into being was an accident and not actually planned? And there are at least three other similarly accidental but positive steps on the growth path of the company. Stay with me to find out. Also, did you know that 7-Eleven is one of the few major brands whose origins can be traced back to the actions of a creative and dedicated employee? In today's episode of Companies Explained, we uncover the origins of this company that many describe as the originator of Quick Stop Department Store concept. We take you through its history to see how it became one of the most recognisable features in the US shopping culture and that of other countries around the world. But before we get to it, I humbly request that you take a moment and subscribe to our channel. You don't want to miss any of our informative and exciting videos about famous brands and companies you often interact with and whose origins and history might pique your interest. We publish several times a week. We appreciate you choosing to watch our video. Thanks. Now back to today's pick. The history of many major brands is often written with the founder entrepreneur being the one who conceived the idea. Think Microsoft, Apple, Facebook or Amazon. This is not the case though with 7-Eleven. The brand came into being in what can be described as an accident. The founder, or let's say the entrepreneur who oversaw its growth in the early days, didn't come up with the idea. Instead, it's one of his employees who saw a business opportunity and acted on it. Now let's get some background to this story. In the 1920s, not many Americans had access to electricity. It was only those who lived in the affluent neighbourhoods of major cities who did. And also, it was still early days for the refrigerator. So even among those who had access to electricity, not many had a refrigerator at home to keep their perishables fresh. But that does not mean people did not preserve perishables. There was a way to do it, and that was to use a block of ice put next to whatever needed to be preserved. So if, for example, you wanted the meat to last three days or a week, you had to pack it together with ice. Do you know what this way of preserving food did? It created a demand for ice, which fortunately could be bought from ice shops nearby. In the city of Dallas, Texas, selling ice was a big business, as was the case around the country. Perhaps to increase efficiency and cut costs, in 1927, several ice shops in the city merged to form Southland Ice Company. Given the need to quickly move the ice from the storage at the store to the consumer homes, the ice stores were mostly close to or in residential areas. One employee of the Southland Ice Company, who's been identified as Uncle Johnny, Jefferson Green, identified a need in the customers he was serving. They needed items like milk, eggs and bread when the grocery stores around were closed. He talked to his employer, one Joe C. Thompson Jr., about the possibility of selling milk, eggs, bread and other items at the ice shop. With permission from his employer, Uncle Johnny stocked these items. And soon, people were buying especially during the weekends and holidays when most of the shops around were closed. Noticing the success, Joe C. Thompson Jr. decided to replicate this enterprise in the other ice shops around town, and each was doing well beyond expectations. Soon, business was booming, and the new venture was generating more revenue than ice blocks. And guess what? This turned out to be the survival path for Southland Ice Company. In the following few years, more Americans had access to both electricity and refrigerators and did not need to buy ice blocks to preserve their perishables. If ice blocks remained their primary product, they would most likely have closed down sooner or later. Then another accident happened. While traveling in Alaska, an associate of Joe C. Thompson Jr. by the name of Jenna Lira came across totems, monumental carvings on large poles that are part of the belief system of the Alaskan indigenous people. She bought one of these totem posts, and when she reached home, they set it up outside the Southland Ice Company shops. The totem post became a magnet. Many locals came to shop at the store because they wanted to have a look at it. Noticing that the totem was an apt marketing item, the management of Southland Ice Company went back to Alaska and bought one for each of their shops. And that is how the business acquired the brand name Totem Stores. 
First, customers started referring to the stalls as totem shops, and then the company adopted the name and made it their brand name. And it stuck with them for close to 20 years. Then why did they change to 7-Eleven? In 1946, Southland Ice Company decided to drop totem and take a new brand name. They settled on 7-Eleven. Why? It described the operating hours of their convenience stores, opening at 7 in the morning and closing at 11 in the evening. This tradition that has the source of their name has however changed. In 1963, many 7-Eleven stores began to be open 24-7. The story goes that one evening in 1963, the University of Texas football team coming from a tournament decided to enter into a local 7-Eleven store for a celebratory evening. They didn't leave until the next morning. The next evening, other students came by and overstayed. This forced the management to allow the store to be open 24-7 Soon, other 7-Eleven stores followed suit. How true this story is, we can't tell. And if you noticed, this is another of 7-Eleven's accidental development steps. It could also be argued that the brand just joined a trend at the time. In the 1960s, many businesses, especially in the big cities, were finding it necessary to open 24-7 given the availability of customers to serve. There is one more accidental development regarding 7-Eleven's growth and it has to do with one of their most popular products, the Slurpee soft drink. However, this did not take place within the company. It happened outside the company before the drink became part of the company's staples. Omar S. Knedlek was the owner of a chain of ice cream shops in the Dallas area. One day, his soda fountain broke down and he was forced to put the drink in a freezer to keep it fresh for the customers. When he got it out, it was slushy, but the customers loved it more that way a light bulb went off. He could produce the drink in this form for his customers. He began to offer the drink as a new item on the menu. He also patented it. In the 1960s, his business became part of 7-Eleven and the new product was branded and marketed as Slurpee. 7-Eleven has disclosed that it sells about 14 million cups of Slurpees each month. And since the product was launched in 1966, over 7.2 billion Slurpees have been sold. But it's only one among many products. Over the years, the number of products sold in 7-Eleven convenience stores has steadily grown. Today, you can buy almost anything at a 7-Eleven store. Car auto parts, gasoline, coffee, burgers, pizzas, refreshments, hot meals, shoes, and more. Let's turn our attention to the business model of 7-Eleven. At its inception, the Southland Company, which was behind Totem and later 7-Eleven, was run as a centralized organization. Each store was owned and managed from the main office in Dallas, Texas. Over the years, the company expanded through the building of new locations, but also through the acquisition of existing quick stop retail stores. An example of an existing company that 7-Eleven acquired was Speedy Mart, which had hundreds of locations around the country in the 1950s when it was acquired. The tradition of acquiring existing businesses as a growth strategy has continued to date. In January 2018, 7-Eleven acquired approximately 1,030 convenience stores in 17 US states that used to be owned by Sonico. This is after the latter chose to focus on retail fuel outlets. As part of the deal, 7-Eleven was to surrender 26 retail fuel outlets of its own to Sonico. Acquisitions have worked well for 7-Eleven as a way to acquire larger market share, but also to gain industry knowledge and experience. But 7-Eleven no longer runs as a centralized business. In the 50s, the company adopted a franchising system. This is the model where local businesses and entrepreneurs enter into contractual relationships with the company so that they use the 7-Eleven trademark and brand. In recent years, franchises have formed a more significant percentage of the brand's size including revenue. Through franchising, 7-Eleven has managed to expand to many countries around the globe. Ownership 7-Eleven was an American company. The majority ownership of the company was American until the 1990s. 70% of the company is now owned by the Ito Yakada Company, a Japanese retailer through 7-Eleven Japan. But how did an American company end up being owned by a Japanese company? During the Great Depression of the 1930s, 7-Eleven managed to survive by closing some of its operations and selling some parts of its businesses to pay off debtors. This worked well, and the company came through stronger and more robust. 
the company found itself in a similar but not the same situation in the late 1980s. In 1987, a Canadian financier named Samuel Bellsberg threatened to carry out a hostile takeover of the company. The Thompson family, which was still in control of the company, decided to buy him out. They borrowed a lot of money to achieve this, in addition to selling a lot of company assets. While they succeeded at beating Samuel Bellsberg, the recovery strategy did not work as well as it did during the Great Depression. The debt accumulated from the buyout event ended up becoming toxic and the company had to file for bankruptcy in 1990. It is at this weak point that the Japanese company came in and bought 70% of the shares in Southland Company. Finally, in 1999, Southland Corp, the entity that had been behind 7-Eleven, changed its name to 7-Eleven Incorporated. We can now say that 7-Eleven is more global than American. It has a presence in more than 20 countries around the world. With this, there's been a cultural shift, and in particular, how the brand's stores are placed at the market. When 7-Eleven was launched, it was a quick-stop store for the ordinary person on the street. And this is how it has largely remained to Americans to date. But in the countries where the brand has expanded to, especially in countries in Asia such as Thailand, China, Taiwan and Indonesia, the brand is treated as being a luxury brand to some extent. The locations are mostly in upscale areas of town and the people you're most likely to run into are the affluent type. The service is also different. Some 7-Eleven locations in some of these countries are social settings complete with stages for live bands. The 7-Elevens of the 1950s are definitely not the 7-Elevens of today. We really appreciate you sitting through to watch this video. Please subscribe and share. Thank you.